قالوا واي يقول Who loves Mr. Bean? <laughs> You've got to love Mr. Bean. When I was 18, I lived in Mexico for six months, and um, as I introduced myself to people, and as they found out I was from Britain, more often than not, the response I got was, ah, Mr. Bean. And even if they couldn't speak much English, their response was Mr. Bean. So it became apparent to me that Mr. Bean is probably our most important cultural export from this nation. Now, we're going to come on to that in just a moment, why on earth I showed that at the beginning of this message. But I want to ask you a question uh, at the outset. What has been the biggest moment of celebration in your life to date? Just think about that for a moment. Maybe it was when you got the results that you so desperately needed to get into the course that you wanted to get into, and you open up the envelope, and there you've got the results you needed. Maybe it was when you got notification that you had got the job that you had worked so hard for, that it was a grueling application process and you got given the job that you worked so hard for. Maybe it was when you got confirmation of your right to remain in the UK, you got settled status here. Maybe it was when you got uh, notification that you had got the all clear after a concerning health scare. Maybe it was when you heard that your uh, your best friend was pregnant and you were just so delighted for them. Maybe it was uh, when you saw uh, your son and daughter excelling in uh, sport in some way. They scored a great goal or they did something great in their school in a play and you just celebrated. Maybe it was when your son and daughter son or daughter became a Christian, got baptized. Maybe that was the big moment of celebration for you. Maybe it was when about 18 months ago, Luke Shaw scored in the first two minutes of the European Championships final. And it felt like, just for a little while, for about 45 minutes, it felt like football was finally coming home. And it didn't. I don't know what the biggest moment of celebration you have known in your life was. But I bet when you celebrated, I bet it looked like something. I bet it was apparent to others around you that you were celebrating. You see, when we celebrate, we can't help but punch the air or hug those around us or leap up and down. We can't help but express ourselves in some way because the word emotion is very closely tied to the word motion, which means movement. It's the same thing, really. When we get excited, we can't help but punch the air or hug someone or jump up and down or dance 
or uh, shout out, whatever it might be. When we are excited and when we're celebrating, we show it in some ways. And what I'm wanting to communicate to us this morning as we unpack today's passage from the Bible is that church, when we gather together, should look a lot more like those who are celebrating an important goal in a final or uh, those who have celebrated a great lottery win or celebrated some great news. It should look a lot more like that than Mr. Bean falling asleep in a desperately boring time in church. It should look a lot more like that. Now, what I, what I mean when I say should is not it should because if it doesn't, then God won't be pleased with us. I mean it should logically look like this. It should lo logically look like people being very excited because the, the news that we celebrate is indeed very exciting. So it would be illogical if we were just unmoved. It would be illogical if we just were kind of just like, oh, okay, that's nice. It is so incredible, I want to unpack that for us today, that actually the logical response is that we will celebrate. Now, there are times in our gatherings when, as we even have this morning, that we are going for it in prayer, where we're uh, even lamenting difficult and sad things that have happened, where we're uh, maybe still before God at times, where we're kind of just in awe of Him and who, who He is, what He's done. That's good and right and fitting. But the church should be a place of great celebration, logically. It really should. And today, in, in the passage that we're going to unpack uh, in Exodus chapter 14 and chapter 15, if you have a Bible, you might want to turn there now, we're going to see a moment of mighty celebration amongst God's people. Let me just catch you up on where we have got to before we uh, dive into the passage. God's people... The Israelites have been enslaved by Egypt for many centuries, and uh, they have been oppressed, heavily oppressed. And God has raised up a man called Moses, and he has charged Moses with going and leading his people out from slavery in Egypt. And as we heard last week from Nick, that God had shown his hand in mighty ways, releasing plague after plague upon Egypt until at last Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, relented and released the people of God from slavery. That's where we've got to in the story. And then God leads, and we see in chapter 13, God leads the people through the desert. He gives them a pillar of cloud in the sky to guide them in the daytime, and then a pillar of fire to guide them at nighttime, so they know which way to go. And he's clearly guiding them. And this is where we pick up the story in Exodus 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi-Hiroth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and we've lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi-Hiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. Can you just picture that for a moment in your mind? The Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance 
the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And then the angels, the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. This is astonishing what's happening here. So neither went near the other all night long. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so they had difficulty driving, and the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots, and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. And put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. We're going to read just the first few verses of chapter 15 as well. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. We're going to read a little bit more later on. But we're going to look at this story, this amazing story, and we're going to consider the parallels between them then and us now. We're going to look at God's rescue. But before we do that, we're going to look at the impossible situation then and the impossible situation now. We see Israel in nothing short of an impossible situation. The greatest nation on planet earth at the time have their armies with the highest technology at the time pursuing them and they are stuck. They're stuck between the mighty army of the Egyptians and the sea. These are men women and children exhausted from wandering around in the desert and exhausted from camping. Who here has camped before, right? Camping's fun, but it isn't very relaxing, is it? You just kind of walk around thinking, I really need a shower. I really need a nice warm bed. These guys have wandered the desert for some time and they're facing an army that is really desperate to get them back, desperate to have them back that they might enslave them once more. And you know, I don't know if you've noticed this before, but God orders the Israelites to turn back a bit. He actually, in his orders, seems to put them in an even more difficult situation. Because by his orders, they end up 
stuck between the army and the sea. And God is, in doing so, luring Pharaoh and the army of Egypt into a trap. But to the Israelite people, it just makes the situation look even more desperate. What was already very, very hard, and we could say impossible, is now completely impossible because they're trapped. There's, there, there's no way they're going to swim across the sea. There's no way they're going to do that. One or two super swimmers might do, but thousands and thousands are not going to do it. So this is a completely impossible situation. They're powerless to resist the enemy. Their re-enslavement is only a matter of time away, and they're going to be enslaved again for life. They're going to die in slavery. That's the situation in which they find themselves. And friends, I want to tell you this morning that this is the situation in which we find ourselves before we know Christ, before we come to know Jesus. This is the situation in which we find ourselves. That might seem like a strange thing to say. Maybe you didn't see that coming. But before we come to know Jesus, we are in an impossible and desperate situation. We were, you were, I was a slave, a slave to sin. Jesus says in the book of John in chapter 8 that anyone who sins is a slave to sin. And there's no one here who has never sinned. We were slaves to sin. When we were tempted, we had to go where sin told us to go. We, there was no way of wriggling out of that. We had to go where, where our fleshly desires wanted to go. But the bigger problem is that in Romans chapter 6, we read that the wages of sin is death. So the just consequence of our sin is death. That's the, the, the right fitting just consequence to our sin. It's to die. And Jesus, back to John 8, having declared that he is the light of the world, having declared to the people that he is the Messiah, he's the one that they've pinned their hopes on, he says that unless you believe that I am he, unless you believe that I am the Messiah, unless you believe that I am the light of the world, you will die in your sins. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 24. And so to die in one's sins means to, to die in a place of being separated from God. Separated from God for eternity. Separated from God and God being the source of all that is good in this world. Just think about that for a moment. The source of all that is good in this world is God himself. And so to die in one's sins means to be separated from him for eternity. And here's the deal. We all deserve that. Each one of us deserve that. There's no one here who could say, well, you don't know my situation. That things were hard for me. No, no, all of us deserve that. All of us deserve to, to die in our sins and to be separated from God for eternity. We were facing death. We were slaves to sin. And because we were slaves to sin, we were destined to die in our sin. And because we were destined to die in our sin, it meant that we were actually slaves to something else. Slaves to the fear of death. All of us. All of us desperately dreading the, the moment we get old. Doing all we can to try and uh, prolong what little time comparatively we have on this planet. And this is the situation for millions of people. Millions of people in our nation, slaves to sin, slaves to the fear of death. And there's no way to escape this in and of ourselves. We're all going to die. That's, <laughs> as one famous American founding father once said, the only thing we can guarantee in this life is death and taxes. And that's there's just a guarantee. We're, each of us are going to die. Each of us are going to grow older and die. And there's no way of escaping this predicament that we're in. We are absolutely stuck, rather like the Israelites were stuck. And no one can undo this predicament by doing good. The Bible is very clear on this. The wages of sin is death. There's no payment you can make to undo those wages, those just consequences. There's nothing. We're stuck. Stuck between 
as it were, the impending Egyptian army and the sea. There's no way out. It's an impossible situation. We were helpless, just like the Israelites. Maybe you know that to be true for you now. Maybe you're here, you're not a Christian. Somehow you found yourself here. You are really, really welcome. We're, we're genuinely it, we're thrilled that you're here. But maybe you just know this to be your situation. You just feel stuck, just kind of getting into all kinds of awful patterns of behavior and thinking trying to kind of put things in place in your life, thinking, if I do that, then I'll be able to get free. But actually finding that it just leaves you feeling more stuck because you tried and it didn't work. And you're fearing death. And you try and block out the fact that one day you're going to die. You try and do all you can to distract yourself from that reality. Every time you think of it, every time you're confronted with it, as a friend or family member passes, you kind of, I don't want to think about it. I don't even want to go to the funeral because I don't want to be confronted with this reality. Maybe you're feeling like that today, feeling hopeless and knowing deep down that you stand condemned. What are the words of hope for you this morning? We're Hope Church. We've got a hope. What's the words of hope for you? Well, let me repeat to you these words that Moses uttered in chapter 14. He said this, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. And this is the thing I want you to hear loud and clear. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. This seems totally counterproductive, doesn't it? Because everything in us thinks, I've got, to, I've got to pay off the things I've done wrong. I've got to somehow work so that I can undo the things that I've done and said and thought that were offensive to God. But the instruction here is to be still and trust that God will fight for you. Trust that he will make the way. To stop the striving, we've got to trust God for our salvation. That's Christianity Trusting God for our salvation. Listen, if you are here today and you're not a Christian, you're looking around, and these people seem excited about Jesus. No one here got in on this through any other way than trusting in God to fight for them. No one here got in through their own good works. No one got in through, oh, they've done, they've done some things to, to pay off some, some bad stuff they've done. No, not at all. They had to trust that God would fight for them. Had to trust that he would do the work that they couldn't do. Had to just uh, give up the striving and say, oh, there's someone who has fought for me and I trust him. There's no other way into this living hope. There's no other way into this glorious inheritance other than to trust the God who rescued then and who rescues now in an even more glorious way. We're going to look at God's rescue then and now. So as Moses begins to sing, I want you to picture the scene. There's tens of thousands before him, and he's singing loud. He's going for it in praise. He starts to sing of God as a warrior. Do you find that curious? He starts to sing of God as a warrior, one who fought for them. And listen, this language and this imagery is actually used in the New Testament of Jesus. Where, you might ask, well, in so many places. But Jesus, uh, we've already read from the book of John today. Jesus had a number of close friends. Uh, he had 12 disciples, but within his group, he had three really close friends, Peter and James and John. We're going to hear about them in a minute. But John, whose words we've already heard from the book of John, wrote 1 John as well. And in 1 John 3 and verse 8, we see that Jesus was sent on a mission to destroy the works of the devil. He, we, he, this was his mission. And at Christmas time, we kind of gather around the candles, don't we? And we sing Silent Night. We sing Holy Infant, so tender and mild. And we feel very cozy and we feel very Christmassy and it's lovely. But this Holy Infant, so tender and mild, was sent on a mission. And as he grew in wisdom and stature and favor before God and men, he grew up 
And he was on a clear mission. It says that he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem, where his mission was ultimately to be accomplished. He was on a mission. Hebrews chapter 2 says that Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds power, who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those, listen to this, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. This is the mission on which Jesus came, to break the power of him who holds power over death and to free those for whom all their life they've been in slavery to the fear of death. Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. He came on a mission, a warrior on a clear mission to rescue people, to rescue all that will trust in him, stop the striving and trust in him. And Jesus took these three close friends, Peter and James and John, on a hiking trip one day. And they got to the top of a mountain. And Jesus said, let's pray here. And as they're praying, something curious happened. Peter and James and John, they, I guess they kind of kept their eye open a little bit as they were praying. And they see Jesus suddenly shining bright before them. They've never seen Jesus like this before. He's sudden, Jesus is transfigured. It's like he's, he's glorious before them. And then two other very shining bright people turn up as well. And who are these people? Elijah, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, long dead by this point, and Moses. And Peter and James and John, by this point, they've stopped the praying, right? <laughs> They're looking on thinking, this is incredible. Wait till we tell the other guys what they've missed out on. And what they listen in on is a conversation between Jesus and Elijah and Moses. And what is incredible is that we see this little insight in Luke chapter 9, we can read this story, is that Jesus was talking to them about the exodus that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. In the original Greek, in the language in which that book, the book of Luke was written, it's the word exodus. Jesus was going to accomplish an exodus in Jerusalem. There was a mission which was going to find its pinnacle in Jerusalem, and it was going to be a rescue mission. Jesus is going to do something that has been long planned. And Jesus said many things in his teaching and many things that confused his disciples. And when he was at the start of his ministry, Jesus got baptized by his second cousin, also called John. But then sometime later, he says something really unusual in Luke chapter 12. He says to his disciples that he has a baptism to go through. He's got another baptism to go through. What's all that about? They might be thinking, well, Jesus, we saw, we, we know you got baptized. What is this baptism that you've got to go through? He's talking about a baptism that he would have to go through on the cross. A, a, a baptism that would be a baptism of suffering and dying in our place. He had to accomplish the mission for which he was sent. And to do that, he had to enter the baptism of suffering and death at the cross. Elsewhere in the Bible makes it very clear that that's what he was talking about. He entered the, the raging sea of God's just wrath towards sin on our behalf. He entered in for us. The heavy waters of justice came upon Jesus at the cross. The justice that your sin and my sin completely deserved. The Bible says, truly, he bore our sins in his body on the cross. He was crushed for our iniquities, pierced for our transgression, and the punishment that has brought us peace was upon him. God's rescue plan was accomplished as Jesus, the always existing Son of God, hung on a cross in our place. And as he rose again to life on the third day. So on Good Friday, we were slaves to sin, facing divine judgment and slaves to the fear of death. But on Easter Sunday... We are a liberated people, 
free from sin, free from fear of judgment, free from the fear of death, because we've got life eternal awaiting us. Jesus passed through the waters of death, death in sin on our behalf. Do you understand that? The Bible says that he who knew no sin, he never sinned, he never did wrong, he became sin for us. So he died in sin on the cross for us, so that we don't have to. And he rose again, and we rise with him. And we will ultimately rise when our earthly body fails. We're going to rise to everlasting life with him, because he paid the price in full. He, his, his sacrifice on our behalf was totally acceptable to God the Father. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, that we might enter in boldly. And one day we're going to enjoy everlasting life with him. Well, it started now, but one day we're going to enjoy everlasting life with him with new bodies in a new creation where it's not going to be boring like Mr. Bean in church. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be a greater celebration than any important goal that's ever been scored, than any lottery win that's ever been won. It's going to be glorious, and we're going to celebrate and sing, and we're going to have adventure with him in a glorious new creation. I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. It's not going to be boring. It's going to be glorious. It was all his doing. He saved us. We were helpless. He made a way. We were enslaved, and he brought about a great exodus. We were slaves to a master that brought us misery, and now we belong to a new master who brings us joy. When we say Lord, we're saying master. So when we call Jesus Lord, we're saying, you're our master, you bring me joy now. I'm, I'm, I belong to a new one. We were intimidated by the powers of the evil one. Colossians 2 says that Jesus made a public spectacle of him in his death and resurrection, triumphing over him by the cross, putting the evil one to open shame. Our future was one of continued misery in sin and chasing after the things of this world that only enslave further, with ultimately death and separation from God awaiting us. And now... As I said, we've been brought into a glorious inheritance, a freshly created earth with Jesus, the blazing sun at the center of it all. That makes me want to dance. Does it make you want to dance? I can't dance very well, but it makes me want to dance. It makes me want to punch the air. It makes me want to shout. I'm shouting already. It makes me want to sing. It makes me so excited. And this is what we see at the end of all time. We see the song of God's people. Now, towards the end of his life, this guy John, who I mentioned, one of Jesus' closest friends, he lives quite a long life compared to his friends. Most of them end up being martyred. He lives a long life. And at the end of his long life, he has a series of visions from heaven, and he writes them down. That's what the book of Revelation is at the end of the Bible. And in this book, he sees, in this vision rather, he sees the total victory of Jesus over Satan and sin and death. And in chapters 12 to 14 of Revelation, we see that the whole of human history is depicted as a war that has been raging between Jesus and Satan. This is, this is the kind of like the curtain is lifted. We get to see, see reality for what it really is. And then we see this amazing incident in Revelation 15. We see the people gathered together, all those who have been rescued, all those who've placed their trust in Jesus, all those that have stopped the striving and trusted in the one who fought for them. We see them gathered together. And in Revelation 15, this is, this is beautiful. They sing a song. You want to know what the song's called? It's called the Song of Moses and of the Lamb. Revelation 15. Let's go there now. They held their harps given them by God, and they sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. And this is what they sang. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy, and all nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed." It was the song of Moses, but listen, now it's the song of Moses and of the Lamb. 
because Moses saw a beautiful uh, exodus of God's people out of slavery, but the greater Moses, Jesus, the Lamb of God, has rescued a people for all eternity. This is the beautiful thing that we're going to be joining in with, friends. We're going to celebrate the Lamb of God who was slain for us. We're going to worship Him. We're going to be transfixed by Him. We're going to celebrate and revel in Him. We're going to glory with Him. Friends, God's people should be a singing people. Not should as in, he will be displeased with you if you do not. No, it sh we should be a singing people because it will be illogical not to sing. It's the logical and fitting response to what he's done for us. Because we can't pay him back. No one can pay him back. No one's going to come close to paying him back. But singing, worship, praise of him is the right and fitting response to this great rescue that he has brought about for us. It's the right response. The Bible contains over 50 commands to sing to God. Praise and adoration is befitting of him. Yeah. Corporate worship, coming together to worship him, playing music to him, singing to him, is the right response to all he's done for us. This was Moses' response. This was his gut reaction to seeing the Egyptian army wiped out, their pursuers done and dealt with, a bright future ahead. His reaction was, I can't help but sing. And he started to sing. And he sang in two ways. We're going to go through this quickly. He sang about God and he sang to God. We do the same. When singing about God, he sang of who God is and he sang of all that God had done. And he sang also of what God will do. This is an interesting thing. We do the same. He says in verse 3 of chapter 15, He is my God and I will praise him. Now the word praise here literally means to decorate. I will decorate him. So when we praise God, we, we come to decorate him. We come to uh, bestow upon him the words that are fitting of him. And he sang of God's glory and splendor. He sang of God's self-sufficiency, that God is God. He sang about God's personal ways. He said, he is my strength, my song, my salvation. He sang of God's faithfulness. He sang of God's might in battle. He sang of God's uniqueness. He sang of God's unfailing love. He sang of God's salvation. And this is what we do here. Friends, this is why we gather together every week. We, we come to sing to him. But listen, as we sing to him, we also recall some things. We call some things to our, our minds and our hearts. Some of the most famous uh, scriptures in the Old Testament, and we've got some songs that use these words, are about uh, someone who knew God's ways but has kind of forgotten. And they're just remembering how bitter and sad they are and how oppressed they feel. And then he says this, this I call to mind because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Listen, it's as in worship, we, we come together, yes, to sing to God, but we also, we, we, we sing to our own souls, actually. And we call some things to mind. We recall some things that we need our souls to get a hold of, so we might lift our eyes again. How often are we downcast? I, is it just me? <laughs> I think we, we find ourselves downcast quite a lot. We need to know, and together we need to know this, we need to know who God is afresh and be reminded of it. And actually, we sing to each other as we gather. Ephesians chapter 5 is really helpful in this, where the Apostle Paul says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Go on being filled with the Spirit is the actual kind of accurate way it could be translated. And as you're filled with the Spirit, Sing to each other with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and sing and make melody in your heart to God. It's curious, isn't it? There's two things there. There's a singing to each other and we're making music and song to God in our hearts. So this is why it matters that we turn up. <laughs> I know I'm preaching to the choir here, right? You're here. But we turn up because actually, yes, we need our hearts and souls to be reminded of who God is. We want to come and decorate him with all that is befitting of him, 
but we actually come to encourage one another with our song. We have that even this morning. As people brought their songs. But we, we come and encourage each other with the songs that we're collectively singing to encourage each other deeply because we need that. We really need it. And so to say, well, I don't really want to go along this morning because I heard so and so is not going to be there. There's no point that they're not going to be there. That's just immature. I don't really feel like going today. It's immature. Actually, as we mature, God would have us come with a heart of, I want to be on the front foot. I want to encourage others. And that might mean I come and bring something on the microphone. It might mean I'm praying for someone afterwards. I pray for, I'm not, I'm not saying this out of any kind of boast. I pray for four people before the service. Pray for healing for three people. We all get to do this. It's not, I don't, this is not just me or a few other people. This is all of us. We're coming together to encourage each other. So worship is so important. We pour out our praise to him. And I love, just very, as we come to, to, to land, I love m- the character of Miriam. In verse 20, we didn't get to these verses. She gets on the tambourine and she starts dancing and she sings her own song. Sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. Both horse and the rider he is hurled into the sea. It's a very simple refrain, but everyone starts to join in with it. Like We've had that this morning and in previous weeks. There's a simple refrain. Everyone joins in. It's infectious. Praise and worship is infectious. It will cause others' hearts to soar and to see God for who he is. She sings this song and it leads to exuberant praise and worship. And listen, over the years, I've, I've talked to a number of people who've come to this church. Maybe they've visited, uh, maybe from other cultures and backgrounds. And they've remarked, oh, it's very lively here. It's very lively, the worship. And increasingly lately, I've spoken to people and they said, it's not very lively here. <laughs> it's, it's quite reserved here. Do people actually, do they have anything to celebrate about here? Listen, we've got, I believe, so much to grow in. When it comes to celebration, we, yes, we love songs of de- declaration. We love songs that, of adoration. We love these things. But we, we've got so much to celebrate about, haven't we? We really have. We've, we've got even more revelation than Moses had. We've got, you understand that? We've, got, we've, 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 un, we've come to know the one that he is pointing towards, Jesus. We've come to know the greater rescue that the whole of Exodus points towards, our salvation in Christ. We've got a lot to be celebrating about. So I want to call, I want to call upon worship leaders in this church to, to step up, as it were, and to lead the people. What I mean by that is that, yes, there will be some who will be on the band, some that will uh, uh, lead, as it were, like we've known this morning, but there can be so many. I know there are many, many people who are worship leaders, and it's, it's probably not the best thing that you get a microphone, right? Like that your voice isn't going to just, it's not going to help us in some ways. <laughs> but your worship leaders where you are. I, uh, two years ago, I, I took my dad's funeral, and um, he worked in a factory most of his life, and he was completely deaf in one ear, and his other ear, he had hardly any hearing. He could not sing, okay? He couldn't sing very well. He was a worship leader, and he was one of the most effective worship leaders in, in the church that he was part of, because he went for it. And, peop- and, and, and nothing held him back from pouring out his praise to his God who had rescued him from despair. And at the funeral, I, I kind of joked. I said, my dad was a worship leader. It was a good thing he wasn't on the microphone. People laughed because they knew that he couldn't sing. But he was a worship leader. And listen, I want to call upon worship leaders here. We do need more people to come and bolster our band and, and, and come and speak to me about that. We would love to talk with you more about how that can, we can explore that with you. But we need worship leaders right across this place, not just on Sundays, but when we gather in our life groups, people who are willing to bring a song or a scripture or to just go for it in worship in response to all he's done for us. So we're going we're gonna to do something a little bit different as we close today. Um, I want to invite the band to come back up and those who I have uh, invited as well. I've invited a few other people to come and join me. But... I want to finish by saying this. Let, let me encourage us to be those who are so regularly filled up on all that God has done for us. That we're so regularly um, filled up on uh, this glorious rescue that God has won for us. Let, let us be those who are in the Word of God. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Okay, that means more than just 
maybe putting the Bible on in your earphones for two minutes before you go to sleep, but to be richly in the Word of God that we might be so thrilled by, um, by this great salvation that we just kind of, whenever the band strikes up, we go for it, you know? Let's be those people. I've invited some, you're all wondering what on earth is going on. You're not even listening to me anymore, are you? We're going to celebrate in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to say this. If you know you are one of those people who you just feel stuck in your sin and you know a great fear of death and you've never known this salvation that we have celebrated this morning and that we will celebrate in a minute, there is a moment here for you, a moment where you just need to stop the striving and you need to say, I trust my life to you, Lord Jesus. And I receive your forgiveness, and I give you all my trust for the rest of my life. Maybe just take a moment to do that. Put it in your own words to him. And for everyone else, well, let me just say before we move on. If you have just made that your prayer in your heart and in your mind, maybe you prayed it even out loud under your breath, please speak to someone. Please speak to someone you came with. Speak to someone you've seen uh, on the welcome team or serving in different ways today. Please tell someone because we would love to talk with you about how you can continue in your journey of following Jesus. We'd love to talk to you about baptism. That is a step for you to take to say, my old life is gone. I, I belong to Jesus now. I'm walking with him now. But for everyone else, let's stand together. And we're going to read out the first few verses of Psalm 66. These are going to come up on the screen so we can read them out in unison together. Psalm 66 is one of a number of songs and psalms that we see in the Bible that, um, that hark back to this great exodus of the seas being parted. Okay? So it's quite fitting that we read this out together. Now, I'm going to ask you to read this out with conviction, okay? Not mumble it. We're going to read this out together. It might be a bit messy because we might not get the timing right, but we're going to do this. And then we're going to celebrate, okay? And that means that we're going to move our bodies. We're going we're gonna to punch the air. We're going to shout. We're going to sing. We're going to dance. Are you up for dancing? Are you up for clapping? At the very least, if you're not going to dance, will you clap? Because we can do this because we've got something great to celebrate. So let's... Let's read these verses together. We're going to read just a a few verses, the first eight verses of Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Amen. Let's make it great. Yeah. 